My name is Jeremy Ward. Um, good evening to you. Sorry you're all sitting at the back. I, I want to make this as much of a discussion as possible rather than a uh, me standing up here and talking. Um, I will talk. I, in fact, I do talk endlessly, uh, loudly usually, particularly when people start going to sleep. Um, so, but, you know, give me feedback. I'll probably talk a lot of bollocks. So, you know, if you think I am, do tell me and come back at me. Um, I hope some of the stuff that I'm going to say is going to be a bit controversial. Well, at least provoke discussion anyway, shall we say. Um, I've been doing security for 29 years come September, which is an awfully long time to do anything really, but um, particularly security. When I started doing security, of course, uh, computers were really just starting in terms of personal computers. People were playing with them when I was doing research. A lot of people were buying the early PCs and um, playing with those rather than doing the research that they were being paid to do. But I guess it's still the same these days, isn't it? Um, it's just that you can play more elaborate games these days, you know, as opposed to sort of ping and that sort of thing. Um, but things have moved on in terms of uh, how much information, of course, you can store, how much inf information you can exchange. But what hasn't changed, of course, is the people. Because it's still the same people using it, still the same people abusing it. Um, so what I, I really want to talk about this evening is that interaction between the technology and the people and the processes. So the Cynic's Guide to Information Security I'm going to talk a bit about the technology, I'm going to talk a bit about the people, I'm going to talk about failure, and I'm going to talk in general about um, some of the things that we all experience. So let's just, I guess, as you're all BCS people, you obviously think first and foremost about the technology. Let's look at the technology to begin with. So first, thing I'm going to say is that I think that technology is more likely to be part of the problem than it is likely to be part of the solution. Um, technology is great stuff, you know, I mean it provides most of us with a livelihood. Um, we'd have to find real work if there wasn't any technology, wouldn't we? Um, but it is it is more likely to be a problem than it is likely to be a solution. Think about it, every single piece of technology that you ever introduce into your life, at work or at home, actually creates more problems than it solves usually, at least in the early stages. Is that not true? Certainly is in my life, anyway. Um, so, you know, technology, we love it, but it produces problems. And it particularly produces problems in the security area. So what do we do? We try and solve it with more technology. <laughs> um, there's no such thing as a technology quick fix. You uh, introduce some technology, it produces problems. You try and introduce some more technology to fix the problems that the technology has introduced. And you get into more problems. So. Cynically speaking, technology actually doesn't solve the problems that it introduces. If you introduce more technology, you get more problems. Stop me if you think I'm talking bollocks. Thirdly, all technology will eventually be abused. Think about it. Every single piece of technology, every single application, every single even computer program, somebody has always found a way to do something naughty with it. It's always been abused. Can anybody name me a piece of technology that has not been abused? I mean, since the first early man flaked a piece of flint off a rock, what did they do with it? They probably went and killed somebody. Every single piece of technology has always been abused in one way or another. Anything. Teapots, I don't know. They've probably been abused. Interestingly, I don't know whether you saw this, 
sorry, my mind does this. It flies off at tangents. Um, thinking of teapots, there was a very interesting thing I, I heard the other day about um, porcelain in China. Did you hear about that? Fascinating thing. Because the Chinese drank tea and they invented porcelain, they never invented glass. Because they never invented glass, they never produced any of the things that glass is able to produce, like spectacles, for those of us of advanced years, um, like windows, like laboratory equipment. And that actually inhibited the whole development of uh, Chinese technology advance. Fascinating concept. So technology, even porcelain, has been abused in the sense that you know, it actually inhibited the advance of technology in China. Fascinating. Um, people. Well, I guess those of us who have had anything to do with people know that all instructions will be misunderstood, or if you're dealing with teenagers, which I am frequently because I have three of them at home, they'll be ignored. Um, usually in the most abusive way, um, but they'll be ignored. So misunderstood or ignored. So that's the problem. You give people what you think are very clear instructions and people will misunderstand them. Or they'll think, I don't need to carry that out, so I'll ignore it. Um, the other interesting thing, of course, is that we all know that people do the easiest thing, even if they know it's wrong. Um, you know, if there is a quicker way across a piece of ground, we will take it, even though we know that we shouldn't do, because, I don't know, it might cross a minefield or something. No, no, that's absurd. Um, but people will do whatever is simplest, rather than obey instructions. And this is particularly true, I would maintain with technology. Um, people will do whatever they think is easiest rather than read the manual. Now, the third thing that I want to point out here in relation cynically to information security is that nobody tells the whole truth and nothing but the truth to any form of survey or auditor. Now I've been an auditor and I know that nobody tells me the truth. They'll tell me what they think I want to hear. They'll tell me what seems most acceptable. Um, now you know, I have to admit that I have been surveyed on occasions and I have to admit that I haven't told the whole truth to the survey. I may have glossed over things, I may have missed things out, I may have not exactly told lies but not certainly told the whole truth. And I think, I don't know, perhaps Perhaps I'm more wicked than other people, but I suspect strongly reading the results of surveys and auditors' reports that, that actually it's probably true for the majority of people. They don't tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth when they're being survey, surveyed or audited. <sighs> Failure. <laughs> it happens. So, what do we do? Stage one. We deny it happened. No, oh, no, there wasn't a failure. No, no, it didn't happen. No, 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 no. Nothing happened. No, no, it was fine. Anyone know what stage two is? Anyone like to guess what stage two is? Blame someone else, of course. Well done, absolutely. Yep, so there was a failure. Didn't happen. All oh, right, it did happen, but it wasn't my fault. Somebody else did it. What's stage three? Stage? Sorry? Find an excuse. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, okay, it happened. Yes, it was my fault, but um, 
I was doing something much more important at the time. Now, um, <laughs> I, I have a wonderful example of failure, which I probably shouldn't tell you, but I will anyway. Um, a couple of years ago, I was working in the Middle East um, for a telecommunications company in the Middle East. And um, we were um, involved in building a security operations center for this telecommunications communications company and somebody in the security operations center <laughs> um, was taking their CIISP exams at the time and um, they were working on the module learning about firewalls so they decided that um, to get some practical experience they'd play around with the firewalls um, in the um, in the SOC, in the <coughs> for the telecoms provider. Um, unfortunately, um, they didn't actually, having played with them, they didn't actually correct what they'd played with when they went off shift. As a result, they effectively allowed a denial of service attack against the Sheikh's website, <laughs> which went down. Uh, I think it took about 24 hours to find out exactly what had happened and who was responsible and why. But that, to me, is a prime example of human failure. Because there you have somebody doing something from the best of motives. They were trying to uh, develop themselves. They were um, finding out how to do things. They weren't obeying instructions. There were clear instructions. I'd written them about what they were supposed to do about firewalls and how they were supposed to secure them and the fact that they weren't allowed to play with them, but nevertheless they were doing it, so they were ignoring or misunderstanding instructions deliberately. Um, then, of course, when the failure happened, everybody was denying it. Everyone was saying it was somebody else's fault. didn't happen on my shift. I was on holiday at the time. But then, of course always hits the fan and somebody has to take the carry the can in the end but that's a prime example of, of, of what happens they deny it happened they blame someone else and then they find an excuse so in general we can say echoing the words of um, uh, what's his name sorry him <laughs> Unknown unknowns will happen. They will. They do. All the time. They will happen. But the interesting thing is, if you weren't looking, how do you know it happened? So often on networks, things happen and people don't actually know they've happened because they weren't looking. They don't know what happened, they don't know when it happened, they don't know how it happened, because they weren't actually looking at the time. And then something crops up later and you have to go through an enormous rigmarole to find out exactly what it was, how it was, and how it happened, and what happened, and when it happened. So we're not very good at looking and noticing and generally surveying, if you like, what happened. Okay, that's my sort of opening gambit. That's my introduction. Is there anything there that anybody would disagree with or, or would say that's not true? I think we're all probably agreed that this is a sort of fair summation of human nature in regard to, um, to most things, let alone information security. Absolutely. I would agree with you. So there are more unknown unknowns, if you like. <laughs> Absolutely. I totally agree with you there. So let's look at technology implementation. So why? Why do we, why do we introduce new technology? Do we introduce it because it addresses a risk? If we're doing it, you know, does it, in, does it act? 
actually meet a business need? Do we do it just because some auditor has come along and said, oh, you need a firewall? Sorry, I'm going back some, no. I'm going back some years ago. Oh, ten years ago at least. Oh, probably more. Um, intrusion protection systems were the flavour of the day. Talking ten years ago. Um, intrusion detection systems. So auditors were going around saying, oh, intrusion detection. Have you got an intrusion detection system? And I met several people at that time, several organisations at that time, who were introducing intrusion detection so systems. They didn't even turn them on. They just put them in the rack. And the auditor came along and ticked it. Oh, you've got an intrusion detection system. Oh, terrific, tick. So, you know, why introduce it? Is it actually doing anything? Does it address a risk? Does it meet a need? Or is it just because an auditor has asked for it? Or, okay, so look, we're all people who are involved in technology here. Why do we go into technology? I don't know. Why do we go into technology? Probably because we like playing with the toys. We've got, down here we've got some very old toys, which a, a couple of people were looking at before, before the... Uh, we, we started talking and it was, oh, I remember one of them. Oh, that's, oh. We like playing with the toys. They're fun. They're, you know, I mean, most of us never really grow up. You know, I have to confess that I sort of play with model railways and sad things like that. You know, we enjoy these toys. And that's why an awful lot of us go into technology. And look, I, I can tell you, look, I spent 10 years working for a, a large um, IT supplier. And I can tell you that IT suppliers rely on the fact that most people in IT organisations like to play with the toys. They're like drug pushers. IT organisations come around like drug pushers with their fix. And they say... <coughs> I've got a really neat piece of technology here. Would you like to play with it? Oh, yes, please. What bells and whistles has it got on it that I can play with? And that, honestly, it is a conspiracy between the IT suppliers and the IT organisations in large organisations to buy the new pieces of technology years ago I was at a, um, a lunchtime meeting um, that was given by, um, I can't remember, it was Secure Computing Magazine or something like that. And they basically got a whole bunch of people from the IT industry involved in security around and they were uh, sort of plied us with good food and wine and, and with the idea that everyone would, would, tongues would loosen and they would talk about the, the next developments. And everybody was saying, oh yes, of course, our customers are saying, well, we don't want anything new. What we actually want to do is to make sure that our current technology works better and integrates and works more effectively together. Um, that was at the beginning of the lunch. Then towards the end of the lunch, after the, the wine had been poured and people had had one or two glasses, somebody, and I, this shows you how long ago it is, somebody un mentioned wireless networks. And everyone said, oh yes, well, we've got some great new technology around wireless networks. That's the whole thing. The next thing, the next drug, if you like, that people are going to push on you. Forget about all this consolidation. Forget about all this stuff about getting it to work properly. Let's sell them the next thing. That's, that's how the IT industry works. I'm sorry to say it. I've been involved with it for a number of years now. And I have to tell you, that's how the IT industry works. And it's a bit of a conspiracy, I have to say. It's a neat idea. So, how? When you're thinking about new technology, can you do it in-house? Do you need to outsource it? What is its impact going to be on existing technologies? There are so many times when I've seen organisations 
you know, implementing new pieces of technology without actually thinking, well, what's he going to do to the existing technologies that I've got in place? I mean, you know, how is it going to impact on them? Is it going to make them more efficient or is it actually going to make them less efficient? So is, is the um, investment that I've made in the existing technologies actually going to going to be a wasted investment. The problem is that of course with most organizations, particularly large organizations, that investment that they've made in old technologies is a sunk cost and they don't actually care about it terribly much, which is another thing that the, that the um, IT suppliers rely on. You know, that all they care about actually is, you know, next quarter this quarter's balance sheet, what's happening now. They don't really care about the sunk cost, the money they've spent in the past. But, you know, when you've got it in there, can you maintain it? I mean, there are so many pieces of... Um, there are so many things in information security, which is what I'm mainly concerned with, which actually, uh, they're not out-of-the-box solutions, most of them. They're sold as out-of-the-box solutions, but they aren't. They actually require quite a, d a degree of sophistication and understanding and knowledge to make them work. Now, you know, that could be good for the IT supplier because the IT supplier will probably need to supply a whole load of consultants to help you to make it work. And a lot of, a lot of organizations probably don't realize this and that there you know there, there are certainly certain pieces of technology that I've been associated with which actually require quite a lot of in-depth technical knowledge to make them work which the organizations who buy them don't have so either that piece of technology once bought becomes a piece of shelfware or you spend a lot of extra money getting it in there, getting it maintained, getting it make sure, making sure that it works properly. Will it last? You know, when's the next thing going to come over the horizon that's going to make this thing redundant and obsolete? I don't know. <laughs> These are the problems. I'm just stating some problems here. So, when do you put it in? <laughs> are you going to be bleeding edge or are you going to be racing around in catch-up mode? I don't know. Personally, I'm more of a catch-up man myself. Um, I've seen too many people buying new pieces of technology and um, taking the hit because it doesn't work properly. Can an existing technology do the job? In an awful lot of cases, I think it probably can, actually. Um, if you're in a large organisation, you've probably got a bunch of technology in there, the capacity of which you haven't actually exploited fully. Um, it's in there you don't probably, possibly, don't know what it does fully, but if you did, it might actually do the job that you're looking for in a new piece of technology. I've seen that in a lot of cases, personally. So there we are. I'm terribly cynical about technology. I don't know whether you gathered that, but um, terribly cynical. So the uses and abuses of technology. Well, I've said some of this already, but marketing versus reality. <coughs> I have to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, but threats are often used as marketing opportunities. And I can tell you the biggest marketing opportunity in the IT security business in the last 10 years was the US introduction of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. It was wonderful. We sold masses of stuff on the basis of the, the threat of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. For those of you who don't know what the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, basically these, this was something that said that any company that was quoted on the New York Stock Exchange had to have in place a whole bunch of, uh, of um, security measures. Um, wonderful for the, for the IT security industry. Terrific. Every single new threat that comes out is used as a marketing opportunity by the IT security industry. I mean, that's, you know, I'm, look, I'm not saying that they do it cynically or they do it 
exploitatively. This is what they do. This is, <laughs> you, you know, this is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD. It's, it's, it's a sales technique. If something comes over the horizon, a new threat comes over the horizon, then you use it as a selling point. That's what you do when you're in the IT industry. The second point I'd like to make to you is that often IT vendors sell you solutions which they've put together as neat ideas, as neat pieces of technology, where they're actually in search of a problem. So they're trying to sell you the solution to a problem that you don't necessarily have. I mean, you might have it, but, you know, probability is that you don't. Um, and they tend to be very good at convincing you that you've got this problem, even if you don't have this problem. And, you know, there are a lot of people who fall for that. But often, yeah, I'm not saying anything that bad against the technology. It may be very good technology. It may be that in a couple of years time actually you'll need this technology, but you may not need it now. It's, it's technology solutions that are in search of a problem. And the third point I'd like to make, I'm terribly sorry about to tell you this, but vendors don't always tell you the truth terribly sad, but there it is. They don't always tell you the truth. I'm not saying they deliberately lie, but they don't always tell you the exact strict truth. Um, the first time I came acro across this was very, very many years ago, when I was still a civil servant, and I was responsible for a very large um, technology implementation. And um, um, surprisingly, we, we had a vendor in who assured us that, that they could do this implementation with no problem at all, and they could do everything that we wanted them to do, and they could do it on time and on budget. Um, <laughs> of course, when it actually came down to it, they couldn't, um, and all, most of the things that they told us they could do turned out not to be the case. Um, and when we actually went live with it, I think we were running, um, we were running on, on, on the servers that we'd run for the pilot system, and we were rolling out the whole thing on the servers that were run for the pilot system. The um, thing ran like a dog, but we did actually get it run out, which was, um, which was my aim. Um, <laughs> we did actually get it roll out, rolled out to the whole population. Um, on time. Um, so that was all right because I could move on to another job and the vendor of course could move on to another customer. But uh, there we are. I mean vendors don't always tell you the truth. It's very sad but true. I'm sorry. Um, second point I'd like to make that any technology is a niche to be exploited. What do I mean by that? Well I started out my working life as a research biologist. Um, I'm actually a doctor of insects. I've got nothing to do with, with, with computers, really. Um, bugs, things with six legs. Uh, now, in terms of ecology, you'll know, or perhaps you won't, but every animal, plant, living organism occupies a niche. Something that it does in other words, it takes stuff in, it gets stuff out, it has interactions with all the other animals and plants and other organisms around it. It has a niche. Now, you can look at ecology of technology. So every new piece of technology, if you like, is a new ecological niche. In other words, we were talking before we came over here about um, using shipwrecks as artificial reefs. So what technology is, is like an artificial reef that is going to be populated by a whole lot of stuff. Users, if you like. So every new piece of technology is going to be 
populated not only by legitimate users, but also by people who want to exploit it for nefarious purposes. So think about it. Viruses actually first started with floppy disks, didn't they? Floppy disks. They, before the internet, the virus was actually handed around on a floppy disk. Then, of course, along came the internet, along came email, viruses and worms and so on and so forth started being handed around on email. Then we got online banking, oh, that opened up a wonderful new niche. That was a whole, I mean, that's like a whole continent of, of new ecological niches for the people to exploit. Now we've got social networking, that, that is another massive great continent of, of niches for the criminals to, to exploit. So any new technology is always going to be a niche that's going to be exploited. And any existing technology is going to be abused. <laughs> you know, security protections will be circumvented. People will say, oh, I don't know, I, 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 I can't be bothered with this password stuff, you know. I, 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 I'm going to write it down. I'm, I'm going to share it with, with somebody who's going to remind me. Anything's going to be circumvented. People will use things for non-authorized purposes. They will use their, their um, laptops that they take home from work to do all sorts of things. They will probably give them to their teenage children. There was a case in BA um, a few years ago where somebody took her laptop home over the, it was a long weekend, um, came back in um, the next week. Of course, the laptop hadn't had the virus updates on it because she hadn't been connected to the, the uh, in, intranet. Um, as soon as the laptop was plugged in to the corporate intranet, the virus that had been picked up on that laptop because a 15-year-old son had been playing with it got onto the intranet. The intranet brought down the BA um, online checking system. These things happen. People will circumvent these things they, because they use them for non-authorized purposes. And then finally, of course, and anybody who has teenage children will know this to be the case, everything will be tested to destruction. Inevitably, let's... You know, nobody thinks, well, let's see if we can break it, but, I mean, that is effectively what happens. You will play with it until you effectively break it. So it'll be tested to destruction. All and any existing technology is going to be abused by the people who use it. So the people issues. Culture and experience. Now, it's very interesting. Um, I was talking to somebody at InfoSec last week who'd just been working in China and he was saying it's a completely different experience there. They are totally uninterested in security. All they're interested in is making money. They don't care. The risk factor there is how quickly can we turn it into money. We don't care about security. It's a totally different culture. Every single time you go into a new organization, you have a completely different culture to deal with. Absolutely fascinating. The new cultures, different attitudes towards um, what happens with their systems. Completely different attitudes that may be based on experience. I mean, the, the fascinating thing, of course, is that, that it, it could be based on experience. It could be based on urban myth. It's amazing how some of these stories spread and, and, and people accept them, believe them, and, and, and act on them as if they were true. But a corporate culture is a very, very strong thing. And it doesn't necessarily um, produce a good experience in terms of information security. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I, I was working 
for a very large oil company um, beginning of last year. Uh, their attitude to information security was remarkably high-handed when you consider that they had a, a very large corporate camp campus, almost city-sized. In order to drive on this corporate campus, you had to take a special driving test. And you had to be examined every three years to make sure you could still pass this, this corporate driving test just to drive on this campus. Did they have the same thing for their computers? No. <laughs> the, the culture was there for one thing, the physical security. It's an oil company. It deals with physical things. Information? You know, it's not important. What's important is the stuff we get out of the ground. You know, <laughs> what we know about the stuff we get out of the ground, what we do with the stuff we get out of, well that isn't obviously important is it? I mean that's just information. Anybody can drive a computer but you need a you need a special license to drive a car. <laughs> Extraordinary. Principles versus rules. Well this is an interesting one. Now I'm I'm a bit of a rules person I'm afraid. You know I like writing down rules is very sad, but then I did work for the government for 18 years. Um, but actually, in, in reality, the problem is that there are probably too many rules. What we need is a few more basic principles. You know, I mean, we don't need any more rules saying, you know, under this circumstance you do this, under this circumstance you do that. I mean, the ludicrous thing, you know, uh, this this thing about you know when you go through security at the airport you've got to keep your stuff in a transparent bag right so I went to Gatwick with my liquids in a transparent bag closable bag they said oh no no that's not right because it isn't 20 centimeters by 10 centimeters well, excuse me the principle is it's in a transparent bag that you can open and close and you can look at it. You know, where does it say it has to be 20 centimetres by 10 centimetres? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, you can't take it through in that bag. You either go back to the end of the queue and get a new bag, or we junk your stuff. I junk the stuff, you know. Principles. <laughs> Isn't it more sensible to have a principle that says, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want to know what liquids you're carrying through. We want to be able to examine them in a relatively risk-free way, rather than, oh no, the rule is it has to be in a Ziploc bag that's 20 centimetres by 10 centimetres. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's the principle that we really ought to be looking at. And all too often, I think, nowadays, we're looking at rules rather than principles. Understanding versus coercion. Well, it is actually much better if people understand why they're doing things. So you understand why you shouldn't open attachments to emails from people that you don't know, rather than you just make a rule and coerce them, saying, you must not open that. Well, why? make them understand the dangers of it you know it's much better if they understand it than if they just have a simple rule saying you know because then they say well why I don't understand why I mean what well, what's the point you know, it looks all right why shouldn't I open it but if they understand the dangers then they're less likely to do it so understanding versus coercion realism versus idealism well you know in an ideal world, well actually in an ideal world, we wouldn't let anybody use computers because they're far too dangerous. Um, but, you know, realism is that people are going to do it, people are going to do it, and they're going to do it more and more, and they are doing it more and more. I mean, when I started, nobody had a, uh, a computer at home, so when they came into work and used one, it was something new, something different. Now, of course, they're coming in and saying, well, why can't I do what I do on my home PC, on my work PC? You know, you've got to work with the reality. You've got to work with that understanding in order to make people aware of what is realistic 
as opposed to try and enforce something which is completely idealistic and won't work. Now, this, this thing, measurement versus guesswork, I am consistently amazed when I go and talk to uh, organizations how little they know about their information security. They don't know, I mean in some cases they, they don't know who does it, um, I, I mean, in some cases, they, they, they haven't got a, a, a clue even how many servers they've got. In, in some cases, well, in most cases, actually, in practically every case, they haven't got a clue how much they spend on it. It's, it's astonishing how little data there is around information security in most organizations. It is guesswork. It really is. There is very, very little measurement going on. Very worrying. Strategy versus tactics. Well, everybody works tactically. Everybody in every organization is far too busy putting out fires to stand back and see the wood for the trees. They're far too busy doing the stuff that they have to do to stand back and say, well, it actually, you know, wouldn't it be better if we started here and moved on to here and then on to here, rather than starting here and then desperately trying to get back to here. It, in most organizations, I'm afraid to say, doesn't happen. Tactics works out over strategy every time. And I think I can sort of prove that by reference to a very little survey that we ran at the end of last year with 20 very large companies ba uh, in, based in the UK in a number of sectors, banking, finance, retail and so on. So what we did, we assessed 31 control areas around information security. Um, and we grouped these into three groups, which we call strategic, which are basically those that are aligned with uh, governance, risk and compliance. Operational, which are really those that are concerned with the delivery of efficiency and effectiveness. And tactical, which are the technical building blocks. So these 31 controls, we asked these organizations to assess their current and their target capability maturity in these areas based around a five-level capability maturity model which is basically the Carnegie Mellon model um, as used by COBIT for example if you're, if you're aware of that. So those are the maturity levels there, the five levels, zero where you've got processes that are not present or not defined, one that you've got ad hoc undocumented processes and so on. So this is how the people assess themselves, so the blue triangle there in terms of strategy uh, operations and tactics um, shows where they are and the, the red one shows where their target was. Now actually the, the triangles don't look that different but you can see that in fact their strategic current was very much, well, was somewhat less than their operational and their their tactical one was that was the top one. So in other words, people are doing less well in their strategy than they are in their operations and um, less well in their operations than they are in their tactical. Now this is very interesting. So these are the controls that they assessed as being most mature. Surprise, surprise, number one malicious code protection. Well, it's been around a long time, everybody knows it, and surprise, surprise, the vendors plug it endlessly and relentlessly because there are new threats coming out all the time. So number one, malicious code protection. Interesting, mobile and remote security came number two. Now if you'd done that three years ago, I would suggests that that one came right down the bottom. But because there's been such a lot of fuss about mobile and remote security, that comes out as number, number two in terms of maturity, interestingly. 
physical security, well, you'd expect that to be up there. That's been around an awful long time, almost as long as me. Even longer. Um, planning and acceptance, well, you would expect large organizations to be able to do planning and acceptance. Interesting, look at that, though. Only one, only one of those top ten mature areas is strategic. All the rest are either tactical or operational. So the only one that is strategic is policy management. Well, you know, everybody's been plugging policy endlessly, so it's not really surprising that policy management comes out as number one. Least mature? Least mature? Asset management. <laughs> Is that a surprise? Not to me. Is it a surprise to anybody here? It's amazing, isn't it? It's absolutely extraordinary. People don't know what their assets are. How can you manage your assets unless you know what they are, for goodness sake? It's absolutely extraordinary. Asset management is the least. Access controls. <laughs> you know, well, I suppose if you don't know what your assets are, how do you know who's accessing them, eh? <laughs> um, so, the other thing you might care to notice, of course, is that the most, most of those least mature ones are strategic. Interesting. Now, you would expect that if people's least mature controls are strategic, that they'd be going to do more about strategy. Actually, they're not. In spite of the fact the least mature group in the most people is strategic, followed by tactical followed by operational in terms of what they're going to do about it it's evenly balanced so despite the fact that most people are least mature in strategic they're still only going to do as much about it as they are about tactical and operational so the top 10 targets The top ten targets are still tactical. So, let's do something that we can understand. Let's do something that's easy. Let's do something that the vendors are plugging. Data protection. Data loss prevention. That's the big thing for all the, I, the IT security vendors at the moment. Every single time. Data loss prevention. What the f does that mean? That's exactly the same as information security to me. But oh no, of course it goes to number one because that's what the vendors are plugging. So there we are. When you look at the difference between maturity and target, uh, current maturity and target, access controls comes out as number one thing that they should be doing. Asset management is number two. Number three is metrics and audit. Because they don't know what they're doing. It's those three things I think are absolutely critical. Managing your assets, managing access to those assets and knowing about what's happening with those assets. Those three, three things are absolutely critical. How am I doing? Do I need to shut up now? Another five minutes or so. Another five minutes. Oh, thank you, Steve. Right. right. Um, okay, so balanced risk. So what we need to do is balance information security against operational effectiveness and efficiency. We do this by finding not just the threats, 
but also the opportunities. You, you find threats, but you also find opportunities. You then make sure that you can control the vulnerabilities or weaknesses that allow those threats to be exploited, but also control the advantages that you have in a controlled and measured way. The advantages that you have that the opportunities can exploit. If you are able to do that, you're able to manage both your failures and your benefits. And by doing that, you'll minimize the losses which is the information security half of the equation, and you'll also maximize the gains. Now, I would say that these two things are two sides of a balanced equation. So we talk about managing risk in terms of the, the classic risk equation. Risk equals threat times vulnerability times probability of impact, however you want to put it, which is a sort of spurious semi-mathematical formulation, which is, of course, rubbish, as we all know. But the point is that this is actually a balanced equation. It has to be balanced between the bad and the good. So if you have threats and opportunities, they're the two sides of the same coin. So you must be able to detect those and take the appropriate action. If you succeed, you've managed the risk, not only the, the good risk, but the, not only the bad risk rather, but the good risk as well. I mean, I always say that, that taking a step is a very risky action because being two-legged, we're actually unstable. Well, it depends how unstable we are, depends how much we've had to drink. But we are unstable. Every time you take a step, that is an instability. But if you didn't take a step, you'd never get anywhere. So any organization, any person in their life has got to take a risk every time they take a step. But is knowing what that risk is, is knowing what that the potential threat is and being able to balance that and succeeded in doing that means that you can manage the risk. If you fail to do that, then what you have done or is going to exploit your vulnerability or weakness or potentially exploit an advantage and you must have in place something to identify and resolve those potential weaknesses. If you succeed in doing that, you've managed the risk. If you fail to do that, it may, might have an impact. So it has an impact and you must manage that impact. If you succeed, you'll have managed the risk. What comes out at the end is the residual risk. It works through like that. I mean, it's not as simple as that. Of course it isn't as simple as that. Nothing is. But the point is that you've got to look at it in those two senses. So, for example, if you're a, a small company and you want to uh, increase your, your online presence because you want to sell more stuff online, what do you do? You go out and do a marketing campaign and you get more customers coming to you online. That's fine if your web servers are correctly sized to deal with those additional customers who are coming to you online. If your web servers are not correctly sized, what are you going to do with all those additional customers? You are effectively going to launch a denial of service attack on your web servers. And you will hack off not only those new customers who can't get onto your web server, but also your existing customers who can't get onto the web server. So what was a potential advantage that would have been brought by, about by that campaign actually becomes a disadvantage. So the two things are actually intimately related and connected in that way. And I think that people don't appreciate this about security. There is another side. Security isn't just about stopping you doing things. It's actually enabling you to do things better. So you've got to have a system whereby the IT services bit of the business talks to the business bit of the business because 
The IT services bit of the business has to know the strategic direction that the business is going into. It's got to know the programs that are being put in place to make that strategic direction work. It's got to be able to analyze those strategic directions and those risks in the program in order to make sure they understand what potentially might happen when those programs take place in order that they can manage the business continuity in any potential incidents that arise. They can fix any potential vulnerabilities and prevent any potential threats. But it works in the other direction as well. So you've got to detect the threats and fix the vulnerabilities in order to ensure business continuity in order to ensure that the risks are properly taken into account when you're implementing your programs in, sh in order to ensure the correct strategic direction of your business. And if you can do that properly, you can build a proper community of interest around information security where you can get everybody in the business who is connected with this to work in the same direction instead of pulling in different directions. To build something that will work effectively and efficiently not only around security but also to drive the efficiency and effectiveness of your business. I'm not going to go into that. So, finally, have a strategy most organizations don't even think strategically about information security. Where are you trying to get to? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to unite the business around a community of purpose in terms of information security? Measure the outcome. Let's know what's happening. Let's know how these things are interacting and how they're affecting each other. And finally, make the appropriate adjustments. You know, don't just let it go. Make the appropriate adjustments and do things to make it better. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention.